downtown area of North Columbus has seen three different eras of urban development, beginning with the raising of Flytown to the gentrification of Short North and finally construction of the Arena District. Each project highlights the three different approaches to urban renewal, with public support and funding being the main contributing factors to a project's success. In the 1950s, Flytown was a close-lit neighborhood composed of mostly immigrants and Black Americans. Most of the residents enjoyed living there, however, the city did not see Flytown as the tenants did. In 1953, the Columbus Redevelopment Authority cleared the area as blighted in accordance with the Federal Housing Act of 1949, and a bond was approved in 1956 to clear the area. The raising of Flytown was the beginning of redevelopment in this area. The city followed with the construction of the new Interstate 670. This interstate is what separates the two major commercial districts, the Arena District and the Short North. However, the area around the interstate was still seen as a rough area composing of deserted buildings and a few, and a few amount of businesses. Despite the rush to demolish Flytown in the late 1950s, the, hi the highway didn't start construction until 1975. It was not finished until 2003. It was one of the places that the city made its first decisions that we were going to eliminate this blight that's a breeding ground for for disease, it's a breeding ground for crime, it's a breeding ground for people to perpetuate conditions of, of, uh, of ignorance. I lost my house, my business and everything. I have a job or nothing when I got put out. I had to go get a job. I had to buy another house. It cost me more than what they gave me. Subsequently, all the housing in the entire Flytown area was demolished. The Godman Guild was purchased, it was uh, demolished. People were dispersed into all parts of the city. If you talk to old timers, there was discussion about some affordable housing being redeveloped on the site. I know there was some promises broken. When people are in charge and they tell you a certain thing, you expect them to live up to their word. And that never happened. Following the raising of Flytown and the early construction of Interstate 670, the Short North neighborhood, just north of the interstate, was moving toward a state of blight and vacancy in the 60s and 70s, known as an area with high crime rate. John Hansen, a scholar from Ohio State who researched the Short North, described the area as, quote, The neighborhood suffered from lack of investment and the businesses on High Street gradually shifted focus and abandoned the area as the neighborhood conditions deteriorated. This district was titled its name from the local police describing the area as being located just north of downtown Columbus and south of the Ohio State University campus, creating the name Short North. Beginning in the 1970s, people labeled as urban pioneers began to move into the neighborhood with intentions to revive the area. To do so, they started with re renovating aged but striking Victorian houses and began the tradition of the gallery hop. The Garley Hop occurs on the first Saturday of the month and is a large art celebration with the focus being dozens of art galleries accompanied with special events and street performers. Writer Ingrid Williams from the New York Times credits the Garley Hop with transforming the formerly neglected, crime-ridden urban district into the vibrant independence arts enclave it is today. This positive trend initiated by the urban pioneers led to the Short North Business Association that receives funding from the city to promote community and businesses. The Short North is no longer seen as a crime-filled location, but as a unique and trusted arts di district. Furthermore, the undesirable narrative perceived by the nearby residents and citizens started to change. Due to the more frequent policing and the demographic seemingly change from less educated criminals to highly educated residents, or to quote the mindset of the time, a better quality of people. In the 90s, the Short North continued to receive public and community support with the creation of the organization, the Short North Special Improvement District, aiming to improve safety, cleanliness, and the beauty of the district. Today, the Short North is recognized as one of the most successful districts from urban renewal and locally as one of the most impressive areas of Columbus. For example, the Short North website lists some stats of achievement as the Short North is home to over 300 exciting businesses, the majority of which are locally owned or headquartered. 
It has received numerous national accolades and is considered a model for urban revitalization. The district got this success through its promotion and support of small businesses in its unique and artistic community. This influence is shown within the businesses with most having a unique approach on their goods and services. I have visited a couple shops with a few friends, with the first being a restaurant called Milk. They sell gourmet grilled cheeses and burgers. They actually catch you off guard with unusual ingredients on their sandwiches, but they're really good. And the second being Tecma, a charitable clothing brand that sells more trendy and fashionable outfits. During the rising success of the Short North, the city had bigger plans with directing its attention to the development of the Reading District, located just south of the former neighborhood Flytown and now Interstate 670. However, to go over some brief history, even before the city started having thoughts of a renewal, this area was the location of the Ohio Penitentiary. Throughout the 1900s, the penitentiary was extremely hazardous with reoccurring riots, including a few fires. OhioHistoryCentral.org cites. The worst riot occurred in June 1968. A number of buildings were destroyed and five convicts were killed. This deadly riot forced the state's hand to close and later demolish the prison. Oddly enough, this created new space for a location of a sports facility the city has been wanting. To move forward and try to build an arena in this area, the city looked to public funding to supply the construction of this project. Voters in Franklin County were asked to fund an area through revenue generated from increased taxes. In 1986 and again in 1987, the voters rejected the proposal. Action groups such as VAST, Voters Against Stadium Taxes, and Citizens for Private Development combated the bill to fund this arena because of the hefty 25% sales tax increase. The groups accused the city of asking the voters to pay for an arena that would bring large profits to its business partners and not the people of Franklin County. The city went about many ways to try and get public support, but the citizens and organizations didn't believe the development for the arena was necessary at such an expense. The city tried to rationalize the issue with the citizens saying it would create jobs and attract new businesses to the city. Even so, the city was denied public funding up to 1997 and finally opted for a plan B. The new plan involved looking for support from pub private investment rather than public to fund the project. Do, 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 do. Luckily, luckily, Nationwide Mutual Insurance, along with the Columbus Dispatch, agreed to fund the project. It was a 90 and 10 percent split, with Nationwide providing almost all of the 150 million dollar expense. The arena was then completed in 2000, and has grown to a, a successful high end business district. In 2008, Keith Snyder from the New York Times described the district as a $750 million mixed-use neighborhood of housing, offices, retailing, and entertainment has attracted some of the city's prominent architecture, law, real estate development, and advertising firms. The Arena District is the upscale commercial district of downtown Columbus with two highlighting sports stadiums, the Nationwide Arena and in the Huntington Park Baseball Stadium. As well, the surrounding bars and restaurants are pretty expensive and formal. This district has added massive amounts of revenue to the city of Columbus and created many jobs as well, and still has plans of growth and investment today. Each of the three projects mentioned in the downtown Columbus area had different kinds of approaches and levels of support which resulted in different levels of success and productive redevelopment in each case. The urban renewal of Flytown, the first and worst case in this area, had barely any success. Following the raising of Flytown, the area was empty construction site and had no use of land for decades. This is because the city decided to demolish Flytown and change the use of that land to a highway that was not wanted or needed. Furthermore, there was no support from the businesses nor citizens to complete that project, causing the highway to not be finished until 25 years later from the beginning of construction. However, the complete opposite happened for the Short North in the next project. This area had no city investments, but people saw potential in the project and supported the revival of the district, making it a great example of a small business commercial district. Lastly, the Arena District 
didn't have the support of the citizens, but it did have the support of large investors sparking the creation and success it now has. To close and revert back to the first case, the lack of support and non-use of the highway now comes to fruition because both the success of the short north and Arena District created the need and support to finish the project because the highway now connects both districts to create one large district of northern downtown Columbus.